Hello, and welcome to It's Your Future with Joyce Joya. I am Ron Gaioso, co-host. We are broadcasting via Futures Television, the home of the future on television. If you're listening to the show via podcast or watching us on TV, you too can be part of the conversation. Just visit our YouTube channel, and that is IMCI Magazine, where we continue to chat about the topic of the day. You can also access this information on our website, and that is www.futurestelevision.com. We transmit via Roku TV, that's a Roku app, the memory stick, or TV sets, and via Apple TV. So don't forget to add Future Television to your preferred list of channels using your Apple TV device. You can also listen to the show via Radio Futures, the wave of the future on the radio. So let me say a few words about the show. If you have a question about what's coming and would like to find out how to prepare for it, then worry no more. Our host, Joyce Joya, will share lots of valuable information thought-provoking ideas, and some great insights about a variety of topics. And she will cover several emerging trends. And armed with this information and these insights, you are sure to make better decisions. In today's show, join us as we delve into the future of human resources, where culture meets innovation and workers shifting once to needs take center stage. Discover how HR is evolving to foster inclusive, flexible, in technology-empowered environments. Don't miss out on insightful discussions about integrating AI, nurturing well-being, and redefining the essence of organizational culture in the modern workplace. Well, without further ado, let's welcome the host of the show, Joyce Joya. Joyce, how are you doing today? Great to see you, Rob. Great to be back. Wonderful to see you, Joyce. Well, let's let's um, get started. So the first question today, Joyce, how do you envision the future of organizational culture in an increasingly remote and diverse workforce environment? In the future, I see that organizational culture will become more flexible and inclusive, not just lip service, but really. Uh, and it will have a very strong emphasis on connectivity and collaboration. And we'll have to do that across remote and diverse teams. Technology will play a key role because we can use technology to bridge the geographical and cultural gaps and to help us nurture a sense of unity and shared purpose. I think companies will need to prioritize transparency and certainly open communication to maintain engagement because engagement is really one of the keys. The focus will be on building a resilient culture that can adapt and change while it continues to support employee well being and growth. And leaders will need to be more empathetic and conscious, championing a culture that celebrates diversity and certainly supports innovation. We can't hear you, Rom. You're muted. Sorry about that. I think when you go on, on main, I got muted. So I got it. So now in what ways can HR lead the way in enhancing the company's culture with support for mental health and well-being? Meaning just, you know, the whole person, not just employee. Yes, it's really important for HR to lead the way. Uh, and they can do that by implementing comprehensive wellness programs. And those programs have to address all of the different aspects of well-being, not just some of them. Uh, sometimes we tend to focus on physical well-being and ignore the mental aspect, and that's not, that's not the holistic approach that we will need as we move into the future. So by providing resources like, for instance, access to the mobile group coaching platform in Gomu, which offers coaching in various areas, not only career, but in wellness and life and soul. Uh, I think that HR will be able to help the employees to have a safe space for conversations about 
mental health, about all the different aspects of their lives. And HR can take a role in destigmatizing these issues. And they can really encourage a culture of caring. Now, part of that is that HR needs to advocate for policies that encourage work-life balance. And that means mental health days, flexible working hours, and maybe even flex space. In other words, giving people an opportunity to work in either congregate workspaces that are outside of their home and outside of the office or at home or at the office. And what will really be important is to continue to monitor how effective the initiatives are so that you can continuously evolve based on the feedback that you're getting and continuously make sure that you're supporting the workforce that is there at that time. Back to you. Wonderful. So um, how can we make sure that those policies are actually effective? You mentioned that. So can you give us a few examples? How do we measure that? Oh, well, actually, in the case of Ngomu, they actually ask people at the beginning of the session how they feel about a particular topic or how much they know about a particular topic or how good they feel about themselves. And then at the end, they do it again. So you have... Uh, a, you can see the a change really clear before. picture, yeah. And we don't do that enough with most of our training and development. We just don't. And that's that's a real uh, missing piece, I think, in the learning and development space. So thanks for asking. Oh, so I have a question you uh, for you from Facebook. So changing subjects a little bit. So question about technology. So how can AI be ethically integrated into HR practices to enhance employee experiences without compromising that personal touch? Yeah, that's so, so important. And AI can be ethically integrated. Uh, we can use it to enhance decision-making processes, to improve the employee experience, and even use it to reduce bias. And AI can help us to also ensure transparency and accountability. However, it should only be used as a tool to support human decisions, never replace them, especially in areas where we require personalized learning experiences. We can't just send them to the AI to learn whatever they need. Uh, and if we are going to use AI, we must take precautions to include regular audits for bias to make sure that we can justify and explain any AI-driven decisions. Ultimately, the goal is to actually supplement human capabilities and always, always make sure that we're thinking about the human experience because the human experience is what makes people want to work. It what It's what makes people feel good about themselves and feel good about what they're doing. Those are great pieces of advice, specifically on the use of technology. So let's change subjects a little bit. So Joyce, with the rise of the gig economy, how must HR adapt to effectively manage a more flexible and transient workforce? You know, Ron, for years I've been talking about contingent workers and how important they are. And as the gig economy grows, HR must shift and, and change and adapt its policies and strategies so that they can cater to who is in the workforce at that time. Many times we are attempting to treat people the way that we treated the previous generation 
and expect them to have that be okay. We need to consider flexible and inclusive policies to streamline onboarding processes and make sure that gig workers still feel connected to the company's mission and culture. Uh, let me give you an, a quick example. Uh, I, a, a years ago, I had an opportunity to work to be in the right place at the right time and help an organization reduce its employee turnover from over 300% to less than 25% in fewer than five months. And the way that we did that was by honoring the contingent workers needs, wants and needs. And at one time, uh, I remember it was Thanksgiving, and the regular workers who were working beside the contingent workers were getting turkeys. And the, the contract workers got nothing. And I made sure that going forward, that those experiences that the workers were having were aligned with the experiences of the full-time workers because people, it really caused a stir. Well, you know, you're mentioning, you know, treating uh, people equally, and that's very important. So I would like to kind of focus on the DEI. So what strategies mm -hmm. can HR employ to ensure that, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and actually belonging, are giving more than just like lip service, but are integrated into the organization of DNA? How do we go about that? You know, that's a real interesting challenge. And I can't overestimate the importance of honoring DEIB because we, we really need to have regular training and opportunities for open dialogue. And the powers that be, the guys in the C-suite, that's where it starts often. That's where those bad attitudes originate and and they unfortunately filter down so we have to make sure that we are recruiting the right people that we are having the right conversations with the ozone i mean there's many things that need to be done to make sure that we have it have this deib concept in, integrated into the organization. And by the way, that includes recruitment practices because we need to look at them for bias because that's the first place that we would turn off someone who was a minority whom we really need because we, the more perspectives we have the better the organization will be, the, the more profitable the organization will be. We know that study after study tells us, but it, it all starts with C-suite leadership and they are critical to successful implementation. So going beyond the turkey, so leadership must be involved here into this conversation. So we have a different kind of question here. So uh, hi, Deb. Uh, hi, Joyce. Uh, she's saying hi to you. Great show. Can you share some thoughts about how advancements in AI, so back to technology, and automation will reshape the role of HR professionals in the future? So AI and automation. How does it change HR? And it will reshape the role because what it will do is to take a lot of the busy work, scut work, all of those things. We can use chatbots to, uh, to give uh, feedback on things like vacation days and um, sick days and all of those things that unfortunately HR is currently involved with and called on a regular basis to give those answers. And it will free up our HR professionals, our HR leaders, to be able to really think strategically. Now, the question is, will they 
want to think strategically because it might be uh, for some out of their comfort zones. But for those folks, we need to make sure that they have other kinds of development so that they do feel comfortable thinking and acting strategically because HR can be the organization's greatest asset as we move into the future. If only they are focused on being strategic and helping us to, to align the whole organization toward the future. So I kind of wanted to redirect this question a little bit. So you mentioned so pe some people are not willing, others are not prepared. And I know that you basically dedicated a lot of your time and your career for leadership coaching. Could you please explain to us what is the importance of having that trusted partner, a leadership coach next to you, helping you make better decisions? Oh, that is a wonderful question, Ram. Uh, a leadership coach can be a sounding board, a, 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 a trusted advisor. Uh, a leadership coach can be someone that a, a leader can call when they need to think about the, uh, the future and, and decision making and particularly languaging. And the right coach will not give you all the answers. The right coach will help to guide you to finding that answer within you. Because we all have all the answers that we need, really. It's just that we don't know that we do. And the right leadership coach will help any leader to think and act in a way that will actually drive more bottom line profit. And that's really what, why companies are in business. Now, also, uh, the best leaders think about things like DEIB and they are empathetic and they really care about their people. They care about the experiences that their people are having. And the right leadership coach will also help leaders think about those things as well. Yeah, but not just any kind of leadership coaching. So you also are very dedicated and you're very passionate about the future. So having that futures focused coach, I think it's also another important aspect. And that's one of the things I really like about your work is that you constantly kind of redirects us, helps us think about the future. So can you share a little bit about your vision about the importance of understanding the future and futures literacy and futures methods to advance leadership practices? Mm, what a great question. So the uh, there was a book that was written by my uh, late partner, Roger Herman. And the opening of that book, which I wrote, was those who do not look at the future are destined to be its victim. And we credited it to Anonymous because <laughs> my, my partner thought that to open a book with a, with a quote I from his, his partner was a little gratuitous. <laughs> oh, no, no, but, it's a good quote. <laughs> it is a good quote, right? And, and that is my attitude, that either we look at the future, we think about different scenarios of what, of what might happen, or we end up being reactive. Thinking about the future allows us to be proactive. Think about the cities and the governments that do all of that, uh, the, 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 uh, the play acting when they pretend that some disaster is happening. And it's all about disaster planning. It, it, being a leader is not all about disaster planning, but if we think ahead about what could happen in the future, and then we make an attempt to 
position ourselves and our organization to take advantage of what we believe is coming or what could be coming, then we're going to have the greatest, we're going to be the best leaders, we're going to be able to be the most effective, and we're, of course, we're going to drive the most profit. Absolutely. So a different kind of question here. So how can like a data-driven HR practices and predictive analytics transform talent management and organizational planning? So the role of data-driven HR practices. Sure. HR can use uh, data-driven practices and predictive analytics to actually anticipate staffing needs. We used to have to do all of that by hand and brain. <laughs> I remember being in London and meeting the HR director for the largest commercial bank in Saudi Arabia. And they were doing what they called a people review. And basically it was a combination of strategic planning and workforce planning. And they put it together and they were able to forecast who they would need as they move forward. Now, at this point, we have predictive analytics that will allow us to tailor training programs to individual career needs, to even enhance employee engagement and productivity. And if we take this more proactive and informed approach so that we align our workforce development with the strategic plan and the organizational goals and the way that the organization is growing, we're going to optimize the company's success. So it's the data, right? The data-driven processes. And then what I like you that you highlight the importance of this exchange. So we get the data, we go back, we change policies, we see if it's working, we measure it, and then we go back. More like an iterative process. So not just some kind of a, some people believe strategy, you write it off, put it in a, in a piece of paper, and next year you go back and take a look at it what you're saying is no, it's an, an interactive process that we use data to kind of coach us to the process, right? And yes, and, and every different aspect of what I'm talking about today involves launching an initiative, getting feedback, taking a look at how you're doing, maybe adjusting what you're doing, and then moving forward. Every different aspect we have to make sure that we're not like setting something in stone and expecting it to work in perpetuity because it won't. Most likely not. <laughs> so Joyce, uh, got a question here. In, about... Excuse me. In the oh. words of in the words of my friend Marshall Goldsmith, what got you here won't get you there. Okay. Oh, we should write this one down. <laughs> It's a good so, one. That was the name of a book that he wrote, actually. Oh, really? I, I, I will find that one and I will Google it. Great. Uh, so I wanted to change. And so you uh, always talk about the whole person, not just for us to look at the person as, as an employee. So in what ways can HR provide an environment that supports work-life balance and recognizes the evolving expectations of the modern workforce? Once upon a time, I was on Lifetime Television, and I met the, the uh, HR director of this startup company that was located in Culver City, California. And Carol called herself the work police, because every day at six o'clock, she would tour the office and send people home. When she had arrived there, she discovered that there were some people sleeping under their desks. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that was not supporting them, and it was not supporting uh, work-life balance at all. What HR can do is to promote those flexible work arrangements, to encourage employees to take time off, and 
they can do that by ensuring that workloads are reasonable. HR needs to create policies that support people uh, and include in those in that thinking people's personal personal wants and needs. HR should lead by example. HR professionals should not be working until eight or nine o'clock at night because that does not set a good example. Uh, also, regular check-ins and talking with people. And, it, you know, HR can also exercise what we call LBWA, leadership by walking around. And they can walk through the office or call people, uh, set up uh, virtual meetings with people if you have a remote workforce, and just make sure Check in with people, find out how they're feeling. Uh, that way, HR can really contribute and make sure that the organization has a more engaged, productive, and happy workforce. And that's benefit to everybody, right? The employees are happy and the employers are happy too because, again, people are more productive. So uh, a different kind of question going back to the issue of technology and bias, because actually you mentioned both of them. So how can HR utilize AI to improve the recruitment process or processes? And what safeguards should be in place to prevent bias? A lot of questions, Joyce, around technology and bias. Right, 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 right. Years ago, a client of ours, Body Noel, used to use, and I'm sure that they're still doing it because it was so effective for them, a telephone screening system. That is a form of AI. It's much more sophisticated now that uh, we have more sophisticated AI. Uh, but at that time, the cool thing, I believe, is that they they had the same recording for all candidates, whether those candidates were uh, managers or line cooks, there were anyone who was applying for the same job got the same questions and they were read with the same tone of voice. There was no bias whatsoever. Now, some people will tell you that that kind of screening will end up having you uh, hire robots. But they were only using it, <laughs> or robotic people, <laughs> but they were only using it for the first phase. And I'm suggesting it, that you use it for the first phase, not for, uh, for instance, there were about five or six years ago, there were very popular video interviews where you were talking with an avatar and that would tend i would think to to end up hiring people who are more robotic but one of the things that we can do to make sure that we are not biasing the the recruitment process is to use AI to analyze the, the backgrounds and give us a sense for whether that person is likely to stay. And as long as we're using the same algorithm and applying it to all of the, the backgrounds and we have the data in the same order, in the same way, then we know that that AI is helping us, not just um, turning the crank and giving us uh, feedback. It's, it's actually not biased because we've made sure that we, in the programming and the algorithm, where you we're applying the same the same uh, aspects to all of the different candidates. So not just AI or technology for the sake of it, but rather as a tool, 
uh, provided exactly. that it's yeah. monitored and we yeah. constantly look at the feedback. Got it. Exactly okay. what I said earlier. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So a different kind of question about, you know, uh, how you continue to, so about improvement. So what is a best practice that a company can adopt to ensure their employees are continuing to build their skills, focusing on their professional development? So what can the company do in order to help people continuously, you know, invest in the training and development so that we become more skilled employees? What we need is we need to make sure that everybody has a, an individual development program. And this is not something that's new. This has been around for a very long time. Individual development programs are a roadmap for the individual employee to make sure that that individual is moving in the right direction, will uh, their their goals are aligned with the organization's goals. And we can actually use technology to send reminders to people, to make sure that people are on track. And these are things that we used to have to do with leaders. And, and I'm not saying that leaders should not check in with their people at least on a, uh, on occasion on regular on a regular basis but i am saying that in between hr uh, can use ai to to sort of give people a little nudge to make sure that they're looking at their individual development program the other thing that hr can do is to gamify the whole uh, development process because when Can you they explain do, how would that work? That's important. How do you gamify of course. it? Of course. In other words, you could use badges and points and leaderboards, and you could really you could really make it into a, a fun game, so that as people were developing themselves, they were also it was it was also fun and they had a challenge, an additional challenge that um, you were offering a prize, reward, whatever, to the individual for completing a course, completing a certification, uh, whatever it is that would be next in the development process for that individual. Wonderful. So let's, uh, we have a different kind of uh, um, question now. So somewhat along the same, same lines, but so what, in, what role does HR play in shaping and sustaining a positive organizational culture in this hybrid workplace setting? Hybrid work settings are not the easiest for HR to make sure that they're maintaining that positive organizational culture because when people are are uh, distributed over large areas, maybe even the planet, um, what will we, what we have to do is use regular communication, uh, make sure that people have equal access to resources and opportunities, and HR can really ensure that we maintain a sense of community by scheduling virtual and in-person events. And I'm talking about town halls where the leaders talk about what's going on in the organization so that people feel connected to the organization. It's really very important that no matter where people are working from, that they do feel connected to the organization because that's where that company that I told you about that had over 300% turnover had the greatest problem because there people felt disconnected. They never felt really connected to the, the mothership. And that's why I was able to affect 
such tremendous advancement in such a short space of time because we really turned things upside down. And the first thing we did was to make sure that people felt connected and continued to feel connected on a daily basis. And HR also needs to make sure that people's expectations and the company's expectations are aligned. And that's not always easy, but there is technology that we can use to find out those things. However, sometimes that personal touch, reaching out to people one-on-one, -on -one, there's no, there's just no substitute for that. Yeah, but I think you highlighted a couple of important points in there and specifically maintaining that positive work culture. But again, it's so difficult because people are so different. Our needs and wants are different, right? So it must be very complex for HR to manage all of that without some kind of a help or, you know, uh, people uh, budging in, coaches and, and uh, others, specialists who can help. Again, it's, it's a very complex workforce and trying to maintain or even create, right? Create those positive experiences. That's kind of um, difficult. Yes. So I, I wanted to go back to, again, another different kind of question uh, about training and development. So that's from Facebook. Sure. So how can continuous learning and development be integrated into the employee life cycle? And how can AI assist in tailoring those paths to the individual? Actually, can you kind of uh, answer that with the individual development plan that you just mentioned as well? Yeah, sure. So one of the most important things that employees are looking for is that career development. They want to see career pathing. They want to understand how if they join an organization, that organization will help them to grow and thrive. And the best way to do that is to show them the career pathing that is available to them. Now, there may be, it may look like a tree when, <laughs> if they're starting at a lower level, but that's, that's not a bad thing. That's an okay thing because as people climb the ladder, there are decisions that they can make, either go into leadership, management, or HR, or sales, or marketing, and, and being able to see how, if they start at the bottom, that entry-level job, how they're going to be able to grow in that organization while they still stay with the company, that's really important for the organization. And this continuous learning piece is vital to helping people feeling, feel like they're having an opportunity to grow on a continuing basis. Um, what we need to do is embed those growth opportunities at every career stage. And they might be special projects. They might be certifications. Uh, they might be working on um, a special team. But whatever it is, we need to think about people as individuals. And AI can actually help us to do that if we can program all of the different opportunities into the system and then let AI come up with possibilities for the individual. They can actually analyze, they can can even go down to analyzing the individual's learning style uh, so that we can better tailor the, the learning and development that we're offering to that individual. And that's very important. Again, if we tailor the way in which people want to learn, I think they will have a better experience but I also like what you just mentioned in terms of, I think this is really, uh, we're focusing on the skills, right? And you can secure new skills a variety of ways. As you mentioned, you know, can a special project, maybe a volunteer, 
to work with someone in a team that's not my specialty, but some, something I want to learn. So how do you see this? How can we uh, continuously provide opportunities for people or help people understand that, you know, uh, that's how they can grow their skills? Because ultimately, it's about all about the skills. The more skilled the employees are, the more valuable they become, right? So how can we go about that, securing more skills? We can be a role model ourselves so that, and we can talk about the fact that we took time to develop certain skills and now we're where we are. And we can also show them other role models, other people in the organization. We call them, we call them workforce heroes. Uh, people who have started in a in, in perhaps in the place that that those people are, who got the skills in, and and development that they needed, and they're now in someplace else. So we can using uh, other employees who are good role models for those individuals. We can show them how important it is to get those skills. And we, as leaders, can reinforce the value of skill, of acquiring the skills to help people to understand the, the importance of their choosing to grow. I love the uh, workforce heroes. That's something I'm going to, you know, jot down as well. So, uh, Joyce, any guidance? What uh, three strategies HR functions can take to ensure that organizations they serve continue to evolve in a way that fosters inclusivity in the workplace? Three strategies. Sure. The first is be agile. And I mentioned uh, that we want to launch an initiative, see how it's working, then change it or keep going or whatever it is, but that agility can help the organization to bob and weave, to take care of changing, to I'm sorry, to take advantage of changing markets. And, and that includes the labor market for HR because we know that agile organizations are more effective, they're more profitable and we need, we really need to be agile. Number two is that we need to understand that experience rules, and it always will, especially when implementing new technologies. Now, I just happen to have written a book about it, about experience, which I happen to have here. <laughs> Because I believe that experience does rule. And I was actually quoted in Industry Week magazine as saying, you know, it's wonderful to implement all of these new technologies, but we have to make sure that the human experiences with the technologies are the best. And the third is to recognize that happiness is not enough. Your workforce must be engaged to help you optimize profit. And if your workforce is not engaged, uh, God help you because we have, we have labor shortages in over a hundred metro markets in the United States and all over the world. Uh, there are workforce shortages in particular areas. And if you are not engaging your workforce, you're not going to be able to keep them and that's expensive wonderful three strategies from josh today so all right you know it seems we covered a lot of ground today but folks there's a lot more to be learned from joyce but i'm afraid it's all the time we have for today so we'll be looking forward to welcoming you to the next it's your future with joyce joy joyce this has been uh, such a great conversation today thank you so much thank you rom it's been terrific to be with you Wonderful. So, folks, it's time for us to start uh, saying our thank yous uh, for the day. And again, thank you so very much for your being here with Joyce and I. Remember, 
If you're watching the show on Futures Television as a podcast or as a recorded event in one of the social media platforms, you too can be part of the conversation. Watch for the links in this video so you can continue the conversation on our YouTube channel. This show airs on Radio Futures every Tuesday and Thursday, 3 p.m. Pacific. So I hope to see you again on another episode of It's Your Future with Joyce Choya, and I'll leave you with our institutional message. Thank you. It's Your Future with Joyce Joya. Want to know what's coming and how to prepare for it? This show is for you. Armed with this information and these insights, our host Joyce Joya will help you make better decisions both personally and professionally. Joyce will cover all the trends, from social to economic, to workforce, and more. You will have a chance to get your questions answered in a segment we call, I'm Glad You Asked. This is one show you can't afford to miss. Now on Futures Television. It's your future with Joyce Joya.